I have distinct memories growing up of the teacher uh, calling roll, and whenever someone would say your name, you'd respond by saying present or, or here. Right? When do they stop doing that? What age? What grade? Anyone know? I, I don't either, but. Um, it's a fascinating the idea of like making, proclaiming, here I am, I'm present. We're, we're looking at the Methodist, how, how do we agree as Methodists that we follow Jesus? And the, the vows we make when we join the church are prayers, presence, uh, gifts, witness, service. And today we're looking at, at presence. And present is more than just showing up. Because I must confess that there were times I would have said present if the teacher called, that I'm not sure I could have told you what the teacher talked about an hour later and uh, I know that that happens uh, that ha has happened in churches as well hopefully not here or at least not too often but we where we would sign the pad we're here we're present but an hour later we walk out and we're not exactly certain what we did in the last hour uh, looking at Moses, I see an example of someone who, uh, I, as I read it, I, I think he kind of whiffed at being present to God for a while. Because uh, if you look at what happens with Moses, Moses is walking through this land, his family land, that he has walked time and time and time again. He has the flock that he is caring for, and, and you don't take a flock to a new area. You go and scout that by yourself beforehand, I have a feeling. And so he's walking the same land that he has walked many, many, many times before. And this time, he sees out of the corner of his eye a bush that's flickering and uh, gets his attention and he stops and he goes and he looks at it. And we know how the story unfolds from there. We, we have... Um, God calls Moses and says, I want you to Egypt. Moses says, ah. God says, no, really, you're going to go. And Moses goes, okay. Right, we, we know how the story unfolds. But just that moment in which uh, the bush catches Moses' attention, that's what I want to look at. You ever wonder how many times did Moses walk by that bush before he noticed it? Like, did he, did he walk by it once or twice? Had he been walking by that bush for a week? Had, had, how many times did God have to say, hey, I'm over here, before Moses went, oh, ah, there, ah there's something, something over there. Right? How many times did that happen? How many times was Moses present? Here I am, but really just kind of going through the motions. He paid attention that day, and because he paid attention, he became part of what God was doing. I think about what is common in our lives, and I ponder, how many years did I listen to great music, great jazz, before I recognized, oh, that's not just beauty, that, that's an echo, that's a reflection of, of God's beauty. How, how many times did my parent, who were my parents there for me before I recognized that this is not just parental love, this is a reflection of the faith, faithfulness of God? How many times did my friends and my wife forgive me when I said or did something hurtful before I realized that this is an experience of God's forgiveness? How many times do we hear a child laugh before we, we realize, oh, that, that's God's joy, that creation? Right? How many times did uh, Moses walk past that bush before he turned his, his head to see? I don't know, but I'm glad he looked the day that he did. And it's not just the joyous things that gets our attention as well. Uh, there are the good things that God can use to get our attention. There are the things that are more challenging. I was taught by, uh, in, uh, in seminary by a fellow by the name of Rabbi Sager, and uh, as you might guess, Jewish. And um, Rabbi Sager, oh, we would go and we, every Tuesday night for a semester, you'd go, you chill with Rabbi Sager. It was great. And... Uh, he would just tell stories out of scripture and we would struggle with stories together. And we got to a particularly challenging story one evening and he, he stopped and he said, you know what, when, when something bothers you, when something gets to you, when something kind of gets under your skin and, and you know you're just bothered by it, we have an inclination. We want to go fix ourselves a good steak, feel better, turn on some TV. Like, we, we have this sort of, like, built-in escape mechanism. If something's getting to us, let's just go feel better. And he said, you know, maybe you shouldn't. 
Maybe when something is getting to you, maybe when something is hard, maybe when something's getting under your skin, maybe there's something you need to pay attention to there, a bush flickering at the edge of your sight, and you just need to make sure to slow down and pay attention to it. I think he's on to something. Right. And this is not to say like, depression is real. This is not to say to mope all the time. But like we are tempted just to always feel good. And, and sometimes God is there in the joy of laughter. Sometimes God is there in being profoundly bothered by something and realizing that that is something that, that God wants our, us to look at. But to say that God is in the world is, is our faith, that if we have eyes to see, God uses what is common, and what could be more common to a shepherd than a whole bunch of bushes. Right. Now, we do need to practice paying attention, and how do we practice paying attention? Uh, if, if we're going to talk about that, but let's, let's look at the, the, the fellows taking this walk uh, to, with Jesus, though they don't realize it. Two guys are walking along the road on, on the, this is their walk home. They work in Jerusalem. They're walking home from Jerusalem. They are walking home, the same path home that they've walked home for years. And just like they have done many, many, many times before, someone else comes walking next to them. They fall into step together and they start walking, walking together. And then just like any other day, they start hashing through what's happened in the city. And uh, the, the fellow who's walking with them asks, huh, what's going on? And, and scripture tells us that they were not able to recognize Jesus. And yet when they started talking, they showed themselves to be followers of Jesus. And to be a follower of Jesus at that moment, it's not like they heard him on the radio. They had to have seen him to listen to him. And so how many times had they seen Jesus before and they don't recognize him now? How many times had Moses walked by that bush and not noticed it was trying to get his attention? That's the same type of question. I don't know. But what they tell this stranger is they tell him what's been happening in Jerusalem about Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet mighty indeed, and how the chief priests had delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him, and they had hoped he was going to redeem Israel, but then some women had gone and tried to find his body, and they couldn't find it, and they were just kind of confused by what was going on. And uh, this is a lot more than like a bush flickering at the edge of your sight. This is more of like a bonfire right in front of you, and they're not, they're not seeing. And Jesus says, and it comes off as a touch harsh, foolish men and slow of heart, slow to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? And then he goes on to start explaining the ark, the story of, of scripture. And then they go to this house where one of the fellows lives and they sit down and Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them. And in the breaking of bread, they go, oh, that's, ooh, that's, that's Jesus, right? And if you look at what happened again, like just look at like what, if you had to describe at the very basic moves, what just happened. A small group of people got together and they told the stories of scripture. They tried to figure out what they meant and then they gathered around a table to break bread together. You throw in a hymn and you know what that sounds like to me? That, that sure does sound like Sunday morning worship. It's worship, right? You tell the stories of Jesus, you try to figure out what makes sense of them, and then you have communion together. And if we did that on a Sunday morning and skipped everything else, I would still say that we would have worshipped. Worship is the place that we practice attending to the presence of God, saying, present, here I am, Lord, and I know you are here as well. It's a, it's a practice, right? We do it week after week because we need the practice. We need the practice weekly so we don't miss the bush that is burning. We don't mistake the stranger who walks, for, walks along us for just another person when it could be Jesus walking with us. Like, we need to go to practice in the same way, if anyone here, a high school athlete, right? Did you always want to go to practice? No. Did you always need to go to practice? Yes. Why? Because that's what it prepares you for what counts. It prepares you to be able to do what, what matters. And, and I have seen what it's like. When, I've been a chaplain in two different hospitals, and I've seen what that moment when it matters. Because if you're in the hospital, there are two things that are probably true about you. First, 
you're hurting, right? Most people are not in the hospital and, and just kind of like chill, everything's great. If you're in the hospital, you are suffering. And, and the nature of suffering is that it makes you turn inwards and it makes everything awkward. It makes things like just, you try to get out of the chair. You've got out of the chair time and time and years. You've never had a problem getting out of the chair. You try to go to get out of the chair and all of a sudden that part doesn't bend like it should. And you go, eee! right? That, that's part of being in the hospital. Like something is awkward and you're aware of things you're not usually aware of and it's just painful. And, and so that's one thing that's true of you if you're in the hospital. And the second thing that's probably true of you, of you if you're in the hospital is your praying. You are praying because you need to hold on to God because you need to have a little bit of hope to get through this moment. And, and I will tell you that pain makes it hard to pray. And I will tell you that I have walked into many hospital rooms where there are people who have practiced all their lives attending to where God is and then even when it is hard, even when there is pain, they are still holding on to their hope that, that there is resurrection, there is healing, and, and they have that. And, and it is beautiful. I've walked into rooms, I walked into a room of a fellow who, who was dying. Like he, he had about another week to live and uh, his lungs were shutting down and he had spent his whole life filling those lungs to breathe the words of prayer and song. And so when I went in to pray for him and I hold him held his hand before I could say anything he prayed for me like one word at a time because he had to take a breath between every word but after decades of prayer and attending to God and seeing how God was present I thought I was there to pray for him he was praying for me it was powerful right he was naming God in, in my life but he was seeing, and like, I have been part of those moments where people have shaped their lives to be able to see God, and they do it. And I've walked into hospital rooms when there are people who are trying to find God for the first time. And it's hard. Because they're struggling. Right? Practice matters. Worship is practice of attending to God's presence. Where, where is God in our lives? And, and, and it's not that every part of worship is equally important to each of us. Like some of us get more key into different points. Like if, if you had to pick one point for Andy, like one, one for the most important, the most moving part of worship for me is the doxology. And uh, it has been like, like that for years. If... At Duke, when I was in the seminary there, they have a really big church, you might have heard of it. Huge church. And uh, like our church would fit into like one side wing twice of their huge church. And, and I, I, I did not go there to worship very often, like full, everyone gathered, 700 people worship. I didn't really like it. But here's what I loved. If I could get to the chapel right after they opened the doors, and before the little old lady sat up front, I could, I could walk down the, the center of the chapel and with a, they have a six, it has a six second echo. I could sing the doxology and hear six seconds of echoing, singing that at the top of my voice. And it was powerful and I just love that. And if I, if I didn't get there soon enough, there was a lady up front who wanted to make sure everyone had, had room to pray and, and, and kept everything very quiet and, and, and as it should be. I, I loved when I could get there before her. <laughs> but like, what, what is that moment in worship for you? Like, and, and I want you to think about this. What is the moment in worship? What's the thing that you do here that matters most? Right, what's the thing that you do that matters most? I, I'd like you to turn to a person you're not related to, groups of two or three, and, and if you don't have an answer, that's okay, but in groups of two or three, tell the other people around you, what is the moment of worship that matters most to you, that you need week in and week out to be able to practice that God, God is here? Go ahead. I'm 
No, I wouldn't. I do enjoy this. I appreciate that, but that's uh, okay. Andy, I just just wait for the sound. I wonder if I've heard most often of worship a decade and a half. Is Andy Ocean's she's pretty long? Yeah. All right. I, I got what I got. No one heard. I was going to tell you the Methodist Church. So, what happens when Moses is present to God? Right? What happens next for him? He sees a flicker, and next time we really check in with him, he's in Egypt. Right? And what happens with these two disciples? Right? They, they, they break bread with Jesus, and the next thing we know, they are in Jerusalem telling people about the good news of the gospel. When we are present to the world around us, and we see how God is active in that, and we practice doing that here, I, I believe that changes what happens next. Right? To, to pray is to be in relationship to God. To pray is not a, a means to an end, it's a means to a relationship. And so we start with prayer as, as Methodists, because First we, first we have to care who God is. Then we start attending to presence. We have to pay attention to where God is at. We practice that every Sunday so that when we go out those doors, we're paying attention. Prayers, presence, and the third thing in the vows of being a Methodist, and that's what's, uh, what's up for next week, is gifts. How do we take the gifts that we have and get involved with what God's already doing. Next week, the rubber hits the road. Amen. My friends, I invite you to stand and join with me as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ,